Our series is called Broken Together, and we're taking some time to look at some marriages in the Bible and just find out what we can learn from them. So far, we've looked at Adam and Eve, Isaac and Rebecca. Um, last week, it was Hosea and Gomer. I'm going to introduce you to another couple today in a few minutes. Although in many ways, what I'm trying to do here is just discover God's heart when it comes to marriage and um, listen to what his thoughts were at the beginning when he designed this thing that we called marriage. I understand, and I get it, that we find ourselves sometimes a long way away in our own relationships from God's heart and from the ideal. And that can lead to discouragement, despair, giving up, losing hope, all that kind of thing. But I don't want you to do that. Um, it's important that we get God's heart, but it's also important that you know there's hope. So let me give you a couple of... Um, couple of illustrations to just that might help you understand that there's always hope. Nobody is ever beyond hope. I love, um, I read this psalm last night, Psalm 130 verse 1 in the New Living Translation says, from the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. That's a great, a great line. From the very depths of despair, I call for help. And uh, that's there so that when you're in the depths of despair, you'll call and you'll find help. But some of us, uh, some of you, my car is too old, um, have a nav system or GPS in your car or maybe on your phone, and you use it to find your way around. Um, a lot of men don't like to use it. They don't want to be told to take directions, and especially from a woman's voice. So um, I, I know men that will actually listen to her direction and then deliberately turn the wrong way. Now, what happens when you do that, when you um, deliberately disobey her and you turn the wrong way, does she just wash her hands of you? Not at all. In effect, she says, well, that, that wasn't what I had in mind, but since you're lost, um, here's what you need to do to get back on the right path. Have you ever found that to be true? Um, she doesn't give up on you. She tells you how to get back on the right road. Now, God's like that. We, he, he clearly lays out the right path. And sometimes we deliberately choose the wrong one. What does he do? Does he wash his hands of us and walk away just because we've messed up our marriage or our relationships or our life? No. He says, that wasn't what I had in mind for you. That will hurt you. But here's how to get back on the right path. So whatever mess you find yourself in or whether you're just in neutral in a marriage, I want you to know you don't have to lose hope. God can always give direction to get you back on the right path. Um, another thought came to my mind this morning, and that was um, sometimes to find your way back, it just takes one person in the marriage to say, enough already, we're going to fix this. And to dig her or his heels in and say, we were gonna, we're gonna get help and we're gonna fix this. Sometimes that's where it starts. I remember Tim Keller, whose book I recommended to you on marriage, um, talking about this. And he said that years ago, when they moved to Manhattan, he was gonna start a new church there. He realized from his friends that had done this, it would take three years of a lot of work. So he, he actually asked his wife, he said, if we move to Manhattan, can I for just three years? Um, work some longer hours, and then when we get the thing established, I'll be able to pull them back. Well, you, you know what happened. That's never the case. And the three years came and went, and he kept working for a couple of months longer. And, and then she said to him, she said, Tim, you said, and he said, oh, that's right. He said, I'm so sorry. And he totally ignored her, and he kept working long hours. After several months flew by, he came home one day. They live in, they live in an apartment in Manhattan, and he opened the door, and um, the balcony door was open, and he heard some smashing sounds out there in the balcony. <laughs> and he, he didn't quite know what was going on. So he, he walked over and looked out the balcony door, and there she was sitting there with a hammer in all of their wedding china. She had already destroyed two saucers, and she had her hand up to annihilate the third when he, he said, honey, 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 hold on, it's okay. He thought she'd had a complete breakdown. And um, he, he said, what are you doing? And she said, you're not listening to me. You don't get how serious this is. And, and then she, she, she 
blasted the third one into oblivion. And he, he, just, he just threw himself down beside her and said, Honey, I am so sorry. I am ready to listen. I am ready to listen. Um, I've been in those moments in my marriage. I am ready to listen. And, and, and she talked about her pain and how he hadn't listened to her. And, and uh, he said, I am so sorry. And she said, Oh, that's, that's good. She said, That's fine. And she stood up. She hugged him and went back in. He said, What was that all about? He said, Dear, I thought you were having an emotional breakdown out there. She said, I, I, that was just extra china, those other ones. She said, I was destroying. She said, I, I didn't destroy our real wedding china. And, uh, and, but it got his attention. And the point is, it took one person to say, enough already. So maybe, <clears throat> just maybe, that's what it'll take in your marriage is one person to say, we've, we've got to, don't wreck the china, but figure out another way to say, we've got to do something to fix this and get it back on the right path. Um, where I'm going to take you today is to a couple, or maybe more specifically, to a husband in a marriage that has a lot to teach us. They're in the New Testament, but before I get there, um, I want to tell you why I like this couple, and in particular this man. It's because they help me um, with one of what I consider to be the most difficult passages on marriage in the Bible. That's Ephesians 5. It's, a lot of people shy away from Ephesians 5 because it's, it's not really uh, friendly, politically uh, correct in terms of our culture, but it's there and it's God. I, I want to read it to you because just a few verses from there, uh, because the man I'm going to introduce you to in the scriptures is an illustration of this passage. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, who apparently was never married, gives a lot of advice on marriage. And he says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And on it goes. A couple of points about that. Um, that passage, those verses, assume two things. One, they assume that both the husband and the wife are filled with God's Spirit. That, that's the assumption going in there. Um, verse 18, just before this, Paul lays out the principle. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with God's Spirit. When you're drunk, you're under the control, influence of alcohol. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're under the influence, control of the Holy Spirit. Now, what he's going to do is he says, I I'm going to paint you some pictures, this being one, of what it looks like when two people are filled with God's Spirit. This is an, it assumes that. Don't try this if you're not filled with the Spirit, um, would be the counsel. Second assumption is that there's a mutual submission going on in the marriage. Verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So clearly, there's a mutual submission going on, um, and then he's just going to give an illustration of one side of that. Um, the wives, then, are to submit the husbands to love. I would argue, be prepared to argue, that submission is just one more dimension of love. They're very, very close. Um, you could say submission is giving yourself up to somebody. Love is giving yourself up for somebody. They're, they're very, very close. Now, if I look at both sides of that, what frightens me is that the standard for the husband is very, very high. Dan, love your wife as I love the church. What? Are you serious? Do you know her? Um, <laughs> she's in Banff today, so it's, this is a freebie day. Um, you're going to hear it all, a good, bad, and ugly today. Not really. Um, <laughs> pray for her. She's had to endure me for 38 years. But, um, you know, it's like, Dan, the way I've loved you, you love her. And it's like, it, I, I want to say, is that possible? Seriously. How do you do that? Do you know how he's loved me? Unending patience. Utter forgiveness. Um, tremendous grace, rich mercy, and this day after day after day after day, and every time I screw up and come back and own it, he, he starts the relationship again. Are you serious? 
I got to be that to her? I would be tempted to say it's not possible, and then I stumble upon this man in the New Testament who's that way to his bride, and I say, that's incredible. If I was going to describe him in three words, it would be these words, no ordinary Joe. His name is Joseph, and her name is Mary, and there's stories in Matthew chapter 1. I'd like to take you to it. Matthew chapter 1. Now, the problem with this passage is we usually only read it through the lens of Christmas. And as a result, we miss a lot of other rich stuff here, especially uh, what's in their relationship. So I'm going to try and get you to kind of step outside of the Christmas deal, and I just want to read it to you, and then we'll go from there. It says, this is, verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, had sex, that means she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, and that means that he was just. That means he was meticulous in keeping the law. That means that if he was paid under the table $1,000 for a job, he made sure he paid his tax. It wasn't, he didn't miss a beat. That's what righteous means. And he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union, physical union with her, until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Well, you could well ask the question, what's going on here? Because in verse 18, apparently they're engaged. They're pledged to be married. But then in verse 19, it calls Joseph her husband. And then in the end of verse 19, he's going to divorce her. What actually is the situation? The situation is this. In their world, um, to be pledged to be married was called betrothal or betrothal. I have I, I forgot to find out how to say that word. Let's just annihilate that word and say this idea of being pledged to be married in this culture was a very serious deal. It um, much more than our engagement. So if what happened was uh, a mom and dad would arrange the marriage for Joseph and Mary. So, so their parents in the background had arranged this marriage and probably like um, Tevi, gold and fiddler on the roof. They said to each other, we'll learn to love each other because their marriage had been arranged. And then what happened is they would enter into a binding contract where they would be pledged, engaged, betrothed for a full year. And during that full year, um, she would live at her parents' home. He would live at his home. They would have no physical union, but they were, it was so serious they were considered husband and wife, even though the official deal hadn't happened. They were still considered husband and wife. So you, you could only break that um, betrothal by death or by divorce. That's the only way it could be broken. So that's the case here. So you could use the term synonymously, as they do in the text, pledged to be married, married. Um, same deal. Um, it, after a year had elapsed, he would go to her house. He would bring her back to his house. There would be a public ceremony party, and they would begin their married life officially together. So that's the case here with Joseph and Mary. What I want to bring forward for you to consider is what I, I'll just call three outstanding character traits of this man, Joseph. And I want you to notice them. They're, he's absolutely spectacular. I'm not sure you could find a husband in the Bible that even comes close to Joseph. Um, three outstanding character traits of this man. One, he valued mercy over judgment. That's what God does. 
he valued mercy over judgment. So you're dealing here with a man after God's own heart. A problem arose in their relationship. Mary got pregnant. This was a huge deal, especially if you were a just man. I mean, a better paraphrase to bring it home to us in our world, uh, verse 18 might be, Joseph, your girlfriend is pregnant. And Joseph knew he didn't do it. Joseph, your girlfriend is pregnant, and somebody else has stepped in here. It, it's hard, really, to imagine the depth of horror that would have um, struck Joseph that he would have entered into when he found out that Mary was pregnant. His whole world would have collapsed. All of his plans would come tumbling down around him. He would be absolutely devastated. This man would not be able to sleep at night. And, and there's an understatement in the text in verse 20 where it says, after he considered this, the word considers means took deep, serious thought. What it really means is he stayed up night after night after night trying to figure this out. You imagine you're deeply in love with somebody and you think it's all good. Then somebody says, Joseph, your girlfriend's pregnant. And he talks to her and she is. Um, in our world, not such a big deal. In our world, people live together before marriage and it doesn't matter what God thinks, it's, it's what we think that's most important in our culture apparently. So, so they live together and people get pregnant all the time before they're married. Not as big, but in this culture that we're dealing with here, it's, it's absolutely world changing. Um, he, Joseph would have known that the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy allowed for the offending people, couple, to be stoned to death. It allowed for that. But by the time Joseph and Mary are here and the time Matthew's gospel is written, that usually wasn't enacted. But what always happened in this case was a very public and messy divorce before the courts. Normally, what you would do, because... Um, she had cheated on him, and he was devastated and hurt. He would take her to the courts in a very public trial. They would go through it all, and she would be shown for who she really was. He would be exonerated. There would be a divorce. He would get on with his life. She probably couldn't. Um, so Joseph is pondering this, thinking it through. That's why it's absolutely spectacular when you read this phrase, after he had considered this um, and thought about it a lot. Um, he decided to divorce her quietly. Quietly. What does that mean? Well, there was an allowance in the law that you could take your bride and you could take two witnesses and very quietly divorce her. Why, why was he doing that? Because he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. That's an incredible man. This is mercy triumphing over justice. He was a man after God's own heart. This is the kind of man that God could now entrust his son Jesus to. He could entrust him to a man who valued mercy over judgment. And I, I've often wondered, as you see Jesus grow and begin his public ministry, if something of Joseph, his earthly father's character, isn't seen in the way mercy triumphs over judgment with Jesus. It seems like all the time. Remember the day when they threw a woman in front of him and said she was caught in the act? And uh, they wanted to stone her, and Jesus said, well, if you're, if you're clean, you pick up the first stone, and nobody does. And, and it's, he's left with her, one-on-one. -on -one. Then, he, then he says to her, look, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. It, that's the most succinct statement of the good news of the gospel anywhere in the Bible. You're not condemned. Jesus paid your debt. It's all finished. You're forgiven. 2,000 years ago, it was cleared up. So, go and sin no more. Go and live your life in the light of that. Turn around. Follow Jesus. I wonder when I read that if I don't see an echo of Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, a man who um, valued mercy over judgment. And I, and I wonder when I when I bring it into the context of marriage in a broader scale, marriage brings two people into the closest contact uh, that's possible in any human relationship. 
We all, we all sometimes enter relationships and marriage with, with ideals, and we tend to idealize people in relationships. Sometimes we're in a bad relationship, we idealize someone or uh, another relationship over here. But inevitably, the ideal becomes the reality, and you've got to work it out in the real world. In, in marriage, there's, there's always three rooms where the ideal becomes a reality. The bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen. It just gets really real. And... Um, what happens when two broken sinners live together is sin. When two broken people live under the same roof, sin happens. At that point, you have a choice. You can expose the other person's stuff. You really can. You can expose it by, well, just you keep bringing it up, leaving it out there. You did that last week. You did that the week before. You, you never, you never, you always, you know, or you can expose it by talking about it everywhere. You and I have all seen people like that where they, they talk about their spouse in a public way and you think, my goodness, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're saying? You're exposing his stuff. You're exposing her stuff all over the place. Or, or you can expose it by refusing to forgive and hardening your heart. Or you can do the Joseph thing and you can say, you know what? I do not want to expose you to any kind of disgrace. And I remember that love covers a multitude of sins. This is loving like Jesus. He's covering what he presumes to be a multitude of sins. He is protecting his bride. 1 Corinthians 13 says one of the things that love does is it protects, always protects. That's what Joseph is doing. We're talking about a man here that's loving his bride like Jesus loved the church. Um, you can say you have a choice when you're sinned against. You can say, I see your sin, but I'm choosing to cover it with forgiveness. Only, only people who know something of God's forgiveness and grace in their life are able to do that. I mean, I know what I've done to God. And I, I, sometimes I get a picture of how I've hurt his heart. Uh, this week I was reading in Genesis 6 and it says God looked at all the people he created and, and how corrupt they'd become and how violent the earth had become. And it says it filled God's heart with pain. We're dealing with a God that feels. And I thought, yeah, it's such a corrupt world out there and such a violent place. He's got to be as ticked off now as he was then. Before the end of the week, I see my own corruption. I think, my goodness, I'm part of the pain in God's heart to experience grace and forgiveness. How can I refuse to give that when somebody asks for it or somebody needs it from me, especially um, uh, uh, my wife or your husband or whatever? Our sins hurt Jesus infinitely more than our spouse's sins will ever hurt us. Joseph was a man of mercy, not judgment. Here's the second thing about Joseph I see here which really encourages me. second outstanding character trait is that he was actually prepared to deny himself. He denied himself and put Mary first. How so, you say? Well, he makes up his mind on a course of action. I'll divorce her quietly so she's not exposed to public disgrace. But then God intervenes. Isn't it interesting? It says in the Proverbs, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. He had a plan. I'll divorce her quietly. But God intervened. And we, we know the verse. We've read it a million times. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, there's another plan that God has. You're to take her home as your wife. Because what's in her is not from some guy over there. It's from the Holy Spirit. The angel of the Lord, one of the ways of looking at that is to say we're dealing with somebody who stands in the very presence of the Lord God at the center of the universe and hears God's words and then is sent to earth to a person, in this case, Joseph. And what is communicated from the angel to Joseph is exactly verbatim what was communicated at the center of the universe. Joseph, God who sits on the throne, says, take her home as your wife. Yeah. We've heard that before, but do you, do you understand? This would have been an incredible test for Joseph. This was a lot to ask anybody to take Mary home. 
Was he prepared then at this point to have his own reputation in the synagogue and in the community and with his clients just run through the mud? I mean, who would do this? Everybody knows he didn't get her pregnant, but now he's to, he's to shorten this engagement period, bring her into his house and marry her. Everybody would know she's pregnant. Either they would be slandered, or if he spoke up and said, actually, it's all good, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit, they'd say, what did you say? Oh yeah, she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, what have you been smoking? Seriously, Joseph, the Holy Spirit, how long have you thought this? Um, I got a book you should read, Joseph. I mean, can you imagine what went around? The, the reputation of Joseph was immediately on the line if he was going to do what God asked him to do. He had a business. He was a small business owner. He was a carpenter. Could have lost a lot of his business. But to his eternal credit, he did what God asked. He, he didn't put himself first. He wasn't self-seeking. He loved. Love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, is like Joseph, is not self-seeking. Marriage will always require a person to step outside the world of their rights and into the world of their responsibilities. If you can't, if you can't step out of the world of your rights and into your responsibilities and you're not married, don't get married. Seriously, don't get married. It'll wreck you. It'll wreck, it'll wreck everything. I mean, you, you have to be able to say, I am choosing to make this not all about me. And there'll be many times when you have to deny yourself and just do the right thing because we follow a Savior who did that. If he'd stood on his rights, how many of us would be here today? If he chose to put himself first, we would have had a hope. We'd all be in hell. Um, that, that's where we'd be. But he chose to put us first over his own Rights. That's how he expects us to follow him. So I say to you that this man, Joseph, is an incredible example of somebody that loves his bride like Jesus loves the church. Mercy over judgment. Not standing on his rights. Um, then, then the third thing I found out about him, which was really interesting to me, and it's probably the most obvious, the most outstanding characteristic in Joseph, is that he was obedient to the Word of God. Now, there's not much in the Bible about Joseph. In fact, Everything you read about him, he doesn't say one thing. Actually, that would be a good point in a marriage talk, too, for a man. You don't talk. He just, there's not, no recorded word of Joseph here, actually. None. But check this out. Every time you read about him, every time, he's doing what God asked him to do. He just does it. I mean, just look at the text. Um, an angel of the Lord appears to him. Joseph, take her home. Um, and, and he does. He, when Joseph woke up, verse 24 says, he did what the angel said. And then the angel said, oh, and here's the name you're to give him, Jesus. The baby's born. He gives him the name Jesus. The angel appears again a little later and says, oh, take them from Bethlehem down to Egypt. He does it. It's just unquestioning obedience that just strikes me as, this is an incredible man. No wonder his marriage worked. He heard from God, and he actually did what God said. And I, I think that's the way to make marriage work, actually. Um, if, if you're going to make your marriage work, you're going to need his counsel, because only he can figure out your spouse and your situation. And if you're going to do it for the long term, you're going to have to allow him to speak into your life day after day, week after week month after month. Seems to me that God had a plan for Mary and Joseph, and he has a plan for every marriage, and unless I'm hearing from him, I'll miss that. Your marriage might be in a mess. He could speak into that and tell you what the first step out of it would be. Your marriage might be in neutral. He could tell you how to get it back on track. It might be a great marriage, you just want to go up another level. He could do that too, because he's actually never done, which is amazing. Um, he always has more to do. So what I found in the Bible about God is he's called counselor. Now, I'm not against you going and going and seeing a physical human counselor. I suppose they're important at different times in our life. Um, but what I am uh, always staggered by 
is how much time and money people spend on counselors and, and, and never actually sit at the feet of the great counselor and ask him for wisdom. By all means, see a counselor if you need one, but not at the expense of listening to the one who describes himself as a wonderful counselor. He says, I'll instruct you and counsel you and guide you in the way you should go. In the New Testament, he says, oh, by the way, boys, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send somebody just like me, the Holy Spirit. Oh, and his name is Counselor. Now think about this. What kind of a counselor would it be if he or she couldn't talk? The counselor that we have in our lives, the Holy Spirit, speaks, talks, counsels, tells you how to live with that woman, how to put up with that man, how to make it work, what the next step is. He's not just interested in telling you about when the world will end. He's interested in telling you about how your marriage should go from this point on, and you need to learn to listen to the counselor. I read this morning in my devotions, um, I think it was from, it was Proverbs 24, it went something like this. It says, by wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it's established, and through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Now, what that means, it's not talking about a physical house, it's talking about a home, a relationship, your marriage, your family, and what's required there is wisdom, which in that context is skill in living life. God wants to make you skillful as a husband, a wife, a father, mother. Understanding, getting down to the bottom of things. God says, I can give that to you. So here's the problem that I face as a pastor. That I've, I've, I know God is a God that talks. And I know Jesus said, my sheep, I know them by name. And then he said this, he said, and, and they know me, and they hear my voice. And yet, sometimes I look around, and you do too, I'm sure, and you think, there must be a lot of people that don't listen to him. Because if they were actually listening to him, and he was speaking, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. So it, it goes back to, can I just dumb it down like this? How do we hear God? How do I hear a counselor speak? How, how, can I, how can I connect with him so that it works in my life? Can I? Yes, you can. It's only 12 o'clock. Can you give me seven minutes? Um, I just need one person to say yes. Just, thank you. I saw that. I saw it. And we're good. We're good to go. The rest, you can go get your kids. But, um, or talk among yourselves. But I, I would just, can I just take you real quick through a mini it's a mini course on how to hear God. Because my understanding is every follower of Jesus is meant to hear him. That means you and me. And if I'm going to be like Joseph and obey him, it means I've got to hear him first. Here's what I've learned. And there's people that are way better at this than me. I'll just tell you what I know. That's all I can tell you is what I know. Um, number one, what I've learned is this. God is not in a hurry. So if you're going to hear him, you have to slow down not in a hurry. I, I remember one time when I, I literally said, God, I've, it's, a, it's a good day for you because I have 20 minutes here with you. And um, I didn't use those words, but that was my attitude. You know what he said? Well, then it won't work because I'm not in a hurry. Oh, I didn't know that about God before then. He's actually not in a hurry. Very few times you ever read about God just I mean, sometimes you think he's so not in a hurry he misses appointments in the New Testament. Seems like. It doesn't really, but it seems like it. So, all that to say, if you want to hear God, you've got to create some space in your life where you have some unhurried time to be with him. Do you figure that out? I can't figure it out for you. But you have to have unhurried time because he's not in a hurry. And he doesn't walk to the beat of your drum. I have to align my life to his. Second thing I discovered is that I really should, in that time, talk to him about things I know that aren't right in my heart. Confess them. 
ask him to cleanse me. So I want to get my ears as wide open as I can with as little distraction and clutter as I can. So I just, I ask God to forgive every sin that I'm aware of and, and all the rest that I aren't. Just cleanse me so I can actually hear you today. And the third thing I do is I, 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 I love to ask him questions. I think he likes answering questions. So I'll craft some really pointed, specific questions. Why did you make her like that? <laughs> She's in Canmore. But, you know, questions like, why do I have such a hard time forgiving? Or questions like, um, it just seems like we just, life's boring right now, God. How do, we, how do we bring some life back into this marriage? I'm bored. How do I do that? Just ask the real questions. The real questions, just ask them. How do I fix this thing that's unfixable? Ask them real questions. Now, here's, here it gets really important. The next step would be to pay attention to the Word of God and to your heart. Pay attention to the Word of God and to your heart. Now, I know God speaks in a lot of, a lot of ways, but the two primary ways are the Word of God and into your heart. Um, the, his native language is Scripture. So if you want to discern voices out there through someone else or a dream or a word in my heart, the best way is to be so immersed in Scripture that you've got his native language down because it will always sound like that, if I can put it that way. So when I'm wanting to hear from God, I pay attention to what I'm reading, and I pick up reading where I left off the day before. I don't try and manipulate. I just pick up reading where I left off the day before. I pay attention to any Scripture that seems to stand out. Or sometimes it's just a subtle, you should, you should read that again, Dan. Or sometimes it's so dramatic as it's like being personally addressed. But whatever the case, I pay attention to any scripture that seems to sit on me, especially if I hear it again later in the day or the next morning. If you hear it two or three times, you are most likely hearing something from God that you need to pay close attention to. And I said, pay attention to your heart. Um, what I recommend, and, and everybody in the first service, their eyes glazed over, so, um, but this is still true, whether or not um, they liked it or not. But to pay attention to your heart, you're going to need some times of solitude and silence. I'm not asking you to become a monk. I'm asking you to create some times of solitude and silence. Uh, try 10 minutes once a week, and all you do is you become unplugged, and you just go quiet. That's it. Sit in a room, unplugged. It just means what it says, on your own and quiet. But then pay attention to your heart. It'd be a thousand things coming through it. But, you know, solitude and silence, it's like sometimes we're like, because we're so busy, we're like a, a, a jar of dirty Red Deer River water. And what solitude and silence does, it just begins to settle the water, it gets clearer. But pay attention to any thoughts God puts in your heart. He speaks to the heart. That's how he did it to Elijah. The, the classic King James line is through this still, small voice. Um, how do I know if that's God? Well, there's only really four sources of voices when you come right down to it. There's Satan. There's other people. There's God, and there's me. So sometimes it's easy to, you know, to say, okay, well, there's no other people here, so that's down to three, it could be. Satan's sometimes easy to pick up because he doesn't like God. And he usually asks you to do things that God tells you to, not to do. So um, if the voice is saying, you should go um, marry the lady next door, um, and you're already married, that's probably Satan. Um, <laughs> so think about it, folks, really. I mean, it's, you know, if the voice says, oh, it's okay, you don't have to clear that in your income tax, probably Satan. Um, if the voice says, cheer for the Oilers, probably, never mind. I think you know what I'm saying, but um, sometimes, though, the dilemma comes when is this me or is this God? And um, it's clearly not Satan and not other people. You know what I do with that? I usually just run with it. You know why? Because if it sounds like the Word of God, if it's not God, it's my renewed mind speaking, and I should run with it, and so I do. Pay attention to the Word of God and to your heart if you want to hear His voice. Oftentimes, 
Not always. Oftentimes, it comes with your name attached. And God speaks into your, my heart often as Dan. If I don't hear Dan, Dan. It's Dan. Samuel, it was Samuel. Samuel. See, he's a personal God. And he calls people by name. And most likely, when he speaks into your heart, your name is attached to it. Um, if in doubt, find a mature Christian, somebody that's walked further than you, and say, can we do coffee? I'd just like to bounce a couple things off you. I think God's speaking to me, but I'm not sure. And you know, together, try and discern what God is saying. Most importantly, just do it. If you know God's spoken to you, do it. Do, because when you do it, it results in skill in living life. It results in things changing. I'm, I'm almost done here, but I, I would say one more thing about this God speaking bit. My son, Rick, texted me a week ago and said, Dad, just he said, I don't know where this came in. Dad, does God speak every day to us? That was a very good question. And it slowed me down a lot. And I had to ponder that before I gave him my response. But one thing I did say to him was this, that Rick, God's word, like God, is eternal. It, God established it to last forever. That's why I'm personally offended when people say the culture's changed, so we have to change the word of God. No, no, God established this to last forever through every culture, even on into eternity. It still stands, it doesn't change just because we do, just because the majority of people say it should be this way, it doesn't change. God's word is eternal like God. So in other words, all is relevant. I understand that about God's word. Second thing, it is always present tense like God. God's name is not, I was. It's not, I will be. His name is, I am. And so when you read this book, and you're trying to hear God, read it as a love letter from God to you, present tense. Um, the, in the New Testament, in fact, when the New Testament writers in Hebrews try and quote the Old Testament, they say, today is the Holy Spirit says, and yet they're quoting from something centuries before that God wrote, today is the Holy Spirit says, don't harden your heart. It doesn't say today is the Holy Spirit um, once, once said, it says, present tense. So I read this book, um, and a Apply it directly to my world and my life and my questions. God speaking present tense. So I said, Rick, um, I, I, don't, I don't know all the answers to your question, but what I do know is that if God ever spoke to you once, he's still saying that today. So in that sense, he speaks every day. Because if he said something to you once, he's, he, he, st he still says it. For, you know, I remember in 1981, I, I had a um, two-year-old and a two-month-year-old and no money, full of fear one night, just overcome. By, and I got up and went in the living room, and I just I lay flat on the floor, and I just poured out my heart to God, and I said, I, I don't know how to do this thing. I'd just taken on a job as a youth pastor. I'd, I'd been selling real estate. I didn't know anything about being a pastor, and then the senior pastor left, and they wanted me to speak, and I was terrified to speak in a group, let alone in front of people. I said, God, I can't do this flat out on the floor, and I, and I, in, in, in a way that I'll never maybe get back to, to that degree, I, God spoke to me from Isaiah 41, 10, and it was, it, it was as though he was standing in front of me, personally addressing me. Isaiah 41, 10, God says, um, do not fear, for I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. Dismay is when the bottom falls out. Don't be dismayed, because I'm your God, and I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. That was so powerful. You know what? He still says that to me today. What he once said, he still says. There are many days when he says, Dan, I'm telling you, I'm your God. Don't be dismayed. I want you to get on that plane and go to that place, be, and I don't want you to fear because I've told you I'll be with you. It, so if he's ever said something to you once, consider that he's still saying it. Live into it. Um, any of this makes sense to anybody besides me? I think, I think it makes sense to me. Um, I, hope you, I hope you understand it. Um, 
So just to wrap up, all I, all I really wanted to do today, I think, and a few sidetracks, but I, I wanted us to learn from Joseph. And, and I wanted us to learn that if marriage is going to work well, two people have to say that mercy is going to triumph over judgment. Two people need to say, we're prepared to deny ourselves and make it not all about me. Two people ought to be willing to say, as God's will is revealed, we'll walk in that way. I think that would be the counsel Mary and Joseph might leave with us. Let's stand together. Father, we're grateful today that uh, what you once said, you still say. So, Father, we know that your, your counsel sound. It's valid. Father, we thank you that um, when you asked Jesus to go and do your will, he didn't stand on his rights, but he gave himself up freely for all of us. We pray that you, Lord Jesus, by your spirit, would work in our hearts those same attitudes. Lord, we all need your counsel. I pray you'd open our ears wide to hear so that first we would go to you and then other places, but that we wouldn't miss out on a personal encounter with you. Lord, you know our lives today, our hearts, our relationships, our work, our everything. We bring it before you and say, Lord, would you guide us in paths of righteousness this day and this week, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.